we'll start the class with three ohms. Oh. 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 Om Sahana Bhavatu. Sahanao Bunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai, Tejaspida Vadita Mastuma Vit Vishavahai, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Saddarshanam, a beautiful text by Ramana Maharishi. We have seen 28 verses till now. The last three verses which we did was an analysis of the ego I. Throughout our life, we have an I which is in this body. Without this I, there is no transaction which can take place. In the 25th verse, Ramana Maharishi is asking this question. When I say I am so-and-so, where is this I rising? Where is this I, the ego I? When I say I am listening to the class, when I say I am studying, when I say I am walking, I am running, I have woken up, I had a dream, I slept well. Throughout our life, we are using this I, 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 I. This I has never changed, right from our school days, right from our youth, right from our adult stage, old stage, all the ages we are using this I, I for all our transactions. Normally we take it for granted. We never ask this question, unless and until we come to Vedanta. Unless we come to the spiritual side, we never ask this question. If you ask a layman, he would have never thought about this I. So the 26th uh, uh, verse says where this I is coming from. We analyzed this last week and a quick revision of that. The body is inert and it can never say I, body, physical body is inert in nature. It is born of five elements. By itself, it cannot say I. Pure consciousness, which I am, which is my real state, which is my eternal state. It exists without the body, it exists without the mind, and we all experience this in our sleep state. And in the sleep state, we, we don't say I am. So these are the two extremes. Body by itself is inert, like a table or a chair. It cannot say I. I am the pure consciousness, which the Upanishads say is my real nature as in my, in the sleep state. Now, where is this I coming in the waking state? This I is born in the waking state when this body and 
the pure consciousness are linked by an instrument called as the mind. We can never see the mind. There is no other proof for the mind's existence except the scriptures. We may be aware of our emotions. What they are, we don't know because there is some emotions we feel, but what is that? We don't know. The scriptures teach us that this I, which is the ahamkara or the ego I, is born as a combination of two things, the body and the pure chaitanyam, pure awareness. So what happens when we wake up is the moment we wake up, this pure eye shines in our mind. It wakes up the body and the sense organs and it gets the notion, I am this body and I am this mind. This is called as the ego eye. You, we must be very clear. This is a technical aspect of Vedanta. How the ego I comes in. And once you have understood this ego I, then the rest of the picture is very clear. This ego I then is conducting the whole day's transactions. I go to work, I, 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 I cook a meal, I do so many things in the day. And this is how the whole life has been led. The waker, the waker becomes the ego I and he conducts till he goes to sleep again in the night. So in the 27th verse, this ego is born in the waking and also in dream, the ego, another ego survives in dream the dreamer I and the waker I both are resolved in sleep. In sleep, there is a sleeper I, but I don't know. I'm not aware of it. When I get up again in the next day morning, I say I slept well. So these three I notions all of them, they belong to the soul. They belong to the jiva. The jiva is the one who is residing in this body. So the I notion, which is a combination, is also called as the jiva. It is called as the pramata. Pramata means the knower. Chetaha means reflected consciousness. Sukshma Shariram means subtle body. Gra Granti means a knot. These are all the different names given to this ego I, the waker I, the small I, the ahamkara I. And what is the big I, which is my real nature? That is called as pure consciousness which also exists throughout our life. The pure eye is always there. The pure eye is never born, never dies. Ego eye is born. It manifests in the waking. It manifests in the dream manifests as blankness in the sleep state. which means unmanifested in the sleep state. So ego I has got two states, manifestation, manifested I, unmanifested I. Whereas the big I is continuously, invariably present in all the three states. The knowledge of the scriptures is to discover the big I, which is called as the Atma I. 
when the ego disappears in sleep state the atma i is there it is also there right now in the waking state also but we are not aware because of the upadi or the medium of the body and the mind and the upadi or the medium of the world the because of this medium of the body mind and the world we are not clear as to the nature of this atma i or the sakshi i which exists throughout eternally so our whole study is only to discover this eternal i when we discover the eternal i what happens to the ego i is being answered in the verse number 29 which we will study today it's very important because these are all technical if this is a purely a technical topic and a technical inquiry for doing the analysis of who am i you can go through these talks again you can go through these 29 verses 44 verses you can go through this text again and again if you are not clear because this is something which explains to me my own real nature and this is an extension of the mahavakya vichara it's an extension of the bhagavad gita this is an extension of the upanishads because we have studied both these texts these texts become very important for us because after learning these texts which are the scriptures they describe what is my real nature but i may not be able to appreciate the pure nature because of obstacles of either listening correctly or obstacles in the mind which says that this text and all is not really true or it could be my own wrong notions about myself how can i be atma how? so three things are involved number one i must do proper listening of the scriptures which is called as shravanam if shravanam or listening is not perfect then you will have an obstacle and you will not be able to realize the real nature which is atma so listening is got to be clear without any agitations in the mind without the mind wandering you have to listen extremely carefully because this is a very very subtle topic and if you have not listened clearly go back listen again again go back listen to the topic of atma that is the only way to get clear knowledge after getting the clear knowledge you have to reflect reflection is the second part of the study called as mananam unless you do mananam you will not be able to acknowledge that i am atma because there are doubts in the mind intellect and these notions which you have must be removed even arjuna had to remove so many doubts therefore you see so many questions being asked by arjuna in the bhagavad gita in the upanishads it's again a dialogue because there are questions there are answers to be given by the guru and the third is nididhyasanam which is called as dhyanam or nididhyasanam where 
you roll the topics which you have studied in the Upanishads, the nature of the Atma which you have known, which is a Paroksha Jnanam. Paroksha Jnanam means indirect knowledge. That indirect knowledge, you make it as a direct knowledge by meditation on the Atma, on the features of the Atma, on the indicators of the Atma, whatever you have learned through the scriptures. Atma is Nityaha, it is eternal. Atma is never changing. Nirvikaraha, Atma is all pervading. It is everywhere. There is no place where there is no Atma. It is one, Ekaha. It never comes and goes like the ego eye which comes and goes. So these are the features which we are taught in the Upanishads. And that is exactly what Ramana Maharishi is doing in all these verses. He is using the scriptures, but he is not telling us which scripture in which verse number he is using. But he is giving us the gist of exactly the truth as explained in the scriptures, in the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. The 29th verse says, this true being, which means the Atma, the spiritual being, exists where the ego does not rise. That means when the ego is not there, the spiritual being is there. Indirectly, how do we understand? When the waker eye is not there, that means the spiritual being is there. When the sleeper eye is not there, spiritual being is there. The dreamer eye is not there or there, it is there. The true being never goes, never gets extinct. It is eternal. And it will never perish. We will never come to know where it is unless until you search for it. That's what he says in this verse. He says, you must know where is this, where is this coming from? Can there be a being in the form of oneness with the oneself? That means all we, what we are trying to understand is this says that the true being is always existent principle. As long as the ego exists, it will prompt us to become something or the other. So the state of change is basically the state of the ahamkara I. Chandogya Upanishad says that even memory has to be has to be uh, uh, has to be meditated as the ultimate truth, even memory, because it is superior. Why is it superior? This is this is a form of meditation which will tell us, which will help us to realize the Atma. That's all. So we worship even the memory. That's what Chandogya Upanishad says, because through this, our mind gets into a subtle state. The mind becomes sharper and it becomes clearer. Only when the ego totally disappears, never to come back, will I be in my true state of being. That means, what do I have to do? Egoless state of oneness with the self is my permanent state. This is what I have to know it as a fact. When there is no ego, that is my real nature. That means when there is no waker eye, when there is no dreamer eye, when there is no sleeper eye, that is my real state. 
Atma, the precious jewel, is lost in samsara. That means that pure big eye is lost in our waking state because it's covered. What covers it? The mind covers it. Because the mind is externally driven. The sense organs are external. They are driven outside the body. They keep on looking outside. This is the way the Lord has constructed this body. Brahma Sutra also says, Athato Brahma Jignasa. For those who have done the Brahma Sutra with me, you will remember this particular first Adhikaranam, the first verse of the Brahma Sutra. It says, Now you inquire into Brahman. Which means what? You have learned what life is all about. Now you have learned what it can give, what it cannot give. Therefore, in order to realize the real truth, inquire into Brahman. Brahman or Atma is the same thing. The substratum of this body, the substratum of this whole universe is the same one substratum called as Brahman. By inquiring into this, what is the advantage? I will be free from my identification with the body and the mind as myself. That means the jiva, the soul in this body, Today, which it thinks that it is the body, will get connected to the free Atma, ever free Atma, after getting this knowledge from the scriptures. The scriptural study gives us an eye of wisdom, E-Y-E, -E, eye of wisdom. Through that eye of wisdom, I can illumine the unknown Atma. Just like the eyes illumine the entire universe for us, the scriptural words illumine the entire inner universe for us, which is the real truth, which is a fact. We all have to take it as a fact, then only we will be able to get the benefit of this knowledge, which is called as moksha, which is called as liberation or freedom from identifications. And what about this? What is the story of this ego I? The story of the ego I is explained as the law of karma, the law of action, the law of time and space. We have studied in Tattva Bodha that there is a prarabdha karma. That means there is some, something in the karana shariram, causal body, which needs to be exhausted in a particular birth of a body. So during this birth of the body, during the survival of this body, one becomes a karta, a doer of actions, and one becomes a bhokta. Bhokta means enjoyer of actions. So the story of the ego I is known to all of us. I was born on so-and-so date, I studied, I went to school, I studied here, I went to college, I did this, I studied, I got a beautiful job, I am earning very well, and I got married, I got children, I have all the things which I need in this world. I am a fulfilled person. This story belongs to the ego I. It will never get satisfied fully. It will always say, I miss this in life. 
something. It can be for you, it can be anything. If for you, it can be a house. For me, it can be, uh, you know, having a bank balance of $100,000. It's a big thing for me. So I may say that for you, it may be a, a car. For another person, it may be he needs a, he needs a, a wife. For another person, he has to get a first class. For a third person, it has to be, I must be a good singer. The fulfillment is never there. Complete fulfillment is never there in anybody's life. Nobody, even the president of the United States of America wants something. A rich country. So there is no person on earth who is a fulfilled person. Therefore, the striving continues throughout our life, not only in this life, again in the next life, the same continues, it, it continues. When does this stop, the striving, when does it stop? It stops the moment I am aware that this ego I is an appearance. It's an appearance in the waking state. It is not my real state. My real state is the pure consciousness awareness, which the scriptures like the Gita, Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads are illumining my mind. Through that mind, I am able to realize that real nature. I not only realize my pure awareness, consciousness, nature, I also learn to drop this ego I as my real nature. Both the things happen. When both happens, then you're a free bird. Then you are free, completely free. And you can achieve this in this life. So we dismantle, we uproot the prarabdha karma and we go out of the boxing ring of this punyam and papam, merit and demerit for the ego eye. Karta bhokta, we get out of the ring, we get out of the boxing ring. Because I have come to know my real nature, which is pure consciousness, pure awareness. It has got nothing else in it. It is so blissful. It's an eternal being. It can never go out of existence because that is the one which gives, lends the existence to this ahamkara I. The ahamkara I in the sleep state rests in the big I, which is called as the Atma. So we dismantle the ahamkara by Atma Vichara. Inquiry about pure consciousness. That is what we have been doing all along. And what is the logic we use to say that I am not the ego I? The logic is simple. In Sanskrit, it is called as Anvaya Deti Reka. Anvaya means coexistence. And Deti Reka means absence, co-absence. And the logic is, in the, in the waking and the dream state, ahamkara exists together with the pure consciousness. The ahamkara is an apparent existence. It is an incidental nature. Vetireka means what? This ahamkara, which was existence, now it is no longer experienced in sleep state. The waking ahankara is not experienced in the sleep state. So the, all the sufferings, the pains, all belong to this ego I only. In sleep state, there is no pain. Nobody says I, 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 I had tremendous pain in my sleep state. I may not be able to sleep, that is a pain. But in the sleep state, nobody says I was having any pain, any sorrow at all. So through logic, 
I am able to differentiate the pure Sakshi, I, which is eternally there in the waking dream and sleep state. Whereas the waker I is not there in the sleep state. I learned to remove the waker I as an incidental nature. I learned to falsify the ego I. The ahamkara I, it is falsified. It is not destroyed. I'm using a specific word falsified. In Sanskrit, it is called as badaha. Badaha means falsified. Like the snake on the rope is falsified. Badaha. Not nashtaha. Nashtaha means destroyed. I don't destroy the rope snake. I falsify the rope snake because it had, it had risen, risen from the ignorance of the rope. In the case of ego I, it rises because of the ignorance of Atma. The common factor is the ignorance. Ignorance of the rope led to the rope snake. Ignorance of the Atma leads to the waker I, ego I. This is how the scriptures use logic, which is called as yukti, pramanam. There are three things which the scriptures use. One is called as the shruti pramanam. Shruti means whatever the Upanishadic words are there, that is used as a source of knowledge. The second source of knowledge is reasoning. Like this type of reasoning of Anvaya Vithireka. Vithireka means negation. Anvaya means superimposition. Same thing like Adhyaropa and uh, Adhyaropa and Apavada. These are two other terms which are used. The Bhagavad Gita in the second chapter, for those, um, most of you have done it. So it also says that which is night to all the beings in that self-controlled man keeps awake. Where all beings are awake, that is the night for the sage who sees, who sees. That means once you know that that is my pure, once you have understood to separate the ego I and the Atma I, then you are called as a munihi. Munihi means a person who is able to separate the atma and anatma. Mananavan munihi, a person who's got a reflective mind. Atma is reflected in the mind. He doesn't see the atma. But through that mind, he can infer there is a pure consciousness, which is the real knower. Here, when we say that he, uh, what is night to all beings, night means you are in an ignorant state. The jnani is not ignorant because he knows that the sleep state doesn't belong to him, it belongs to the mind. So the sakshi I illumines the waking state, which is the, wake, uh, the state of knowledge. When the sense organs are open, we see the entire world. So this is the state of knowledge. When the mind is sleeping, it goes into unmanifest condition. It is the mind, not me. Sakshi, pure consciousness has no states. That is why it is called as beyond the three states. Transcendental. These are all English words which are used. Beyond. And that is the real cause, the real light in which I see this entire world. 
that is why when i see the world it becomes immanent it becomes all pervading in this universe of names and forms so dharma artha kama basically are relative solutions in the world that means if i want to have happiness then dharma artha kama they give me happiness of this world but they are not the real solution the real solution is knowing the satya atma satya means the independently existing pure awareness consciousness so that was the beautiful verse now we see the 30th verse see these verses are so deep in their meaning uh, therefore i said in the beginning that you need to re read the notes understand contemplate then only you will get the real depth of the meaning of these verses because they are revealing the atma to us what it says here in the 30th verse as one dives in a well of deep waters in the same way having controlled the breath now it is giving us three ways how to discover this atma first by controlling the breath second control the speech third develop a sharp intellect with these three you dive inside yourself then do the inquiry to the root of this i and where you end is called as atma see such a beautiful way he is teaching us the 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 means of knowing the atma see the upanishads tell us very clearly that atma is nirvikaraha they it will tell you all descriptions how to reach there many many of the seekers they after study of the bhagavad gita as well as the study of the upanishads they still say that i have not understood the bhagavad gita i have not understood the upanishads i am still blank i don't know what they are trying to reveal i i don't know the i don't have the knowledge i don't have the experience i can never say i have been transformed and it is text like sat darshanam drik drishya viveka vichara sagara naishkarma siddhi shruti sara samuddharanam these are all the texts written by the disciples who have walked the path of opening up their minds using the scriptures to illumine what is inside their intellect and then discovering in their own heart the truth which is of the scriptures so here again ramana maharishi points out to develop three aspects number 1 the self is lost in samsara samsara means what the ego i interacting through the sense organs with the in external world is called as samsara when i do the transactions obviously what happens is i get affected the mind gets affected i gets i get raga i get dvesha i have likes i do, i have dislikes so because of this likes and dislikes in the mind i enter into delusion of thinking that the whole world i am enjoying or is or suffering is very very real that is why that is why 
this here what we say is the self is lost self means atma i don't know my real nature and i get lost as ego i now how do i retrieve it back how do i pull back this ego i how do i sit down and meditate three things number one mind control mind can be very well controlled by pranayama control of the breath all the people who practice yoga will 100% certify this because at the end of the yoga exercises they feel that they have a very peaceful mind there is no agitations the mind is not disturbed mind is calm it happens because of controlling the breath and ramana maharishi was a great yogi he knew pranayama he knew all the techniques of yama niyama all the things which we normally do in yoga he was a master at it so here he says control the breath can through the breath you control the mind once you have controlled the breath and the mind what happens is your speech becomes controlled before doing yoga and after you doing yoga you will find a big difference in what you speak how fast you speak and with what focus do you speak big big difference therefore the three the three techniques are extremely useful for discovering that pure consciousness we should never forget that there is atma which i am trying to discover through these three things yoga has to be used finally to discover the truth of about yourself which is the pure awareness and that can be known only when you bring the scriptures into the intellect the intellect on its own will never discover atma unless you bring the scriptural verses and use them to say aham brahma asmi i am that pure consciousness as revealed in so many different texts the self which is shining jewel in this universe which is the atma is lost in the deep waters of the thoughts all of us get immersed in our thoughts <clears throat> and we get deluded we spend the whole day either gain achieving something either trying to gain something or trying to maintain what we have gained these are the two things what we don't have we try to gain what we have we try to hold on to it our whole life is only on these two actions a well qualified pure subtle single pointed intellect is the only instrument which can dive deep into our personality and this intellect can be sharpened by yoga can be sharpened by japam it can be sharpened by so many different aspects just by chanting you can sharpen the intellect chanting vishnu sahasranamam chanting the bhagavad gita chanting simple verses you need not be ex extremely good in chanting you can just have simple verses and then that will help you to sharpen the intellect <clears throat> and of course pranayama i told you uh, is very useful to 
keep the mind in absorption of the knowledge of Atma. Once we have discovered that this is my real nature, we, like I said in, uh, in the previous uh, classes, I said that dharana dhyana samadhi. Dharana means trying to focus, trying to get the mind into an area of removing it from the external world and trying to get it in, into the inner world. That is called as dharana. Once you have brought that mind into the inner world, then you have to focus, which is called as dhyanam. The mind which has been brought from an external atmosphere into the inner world is then used to focus. It's like focusing the lens of a camera. So then you, once you focus the mind and then you start illumining what is inside your mind, inside the intellect, what is the universe which exists? This is the point where we have to use the scriptures. Here we have to say, Aham Brahma Asmi. I am that pure consciousness. That thought has to be brought about because once you are started focusing, there is no other thought. You have brought the mind, you have entered into dhyanam, and then here is where you have to use whatever the indicators of the Atma. I am that pure consciousness, let that thought come in. I am eternal, let that thought come in. I am changeless. Let that thought come in. This is the dhyanam process. This is a deliberate action. Once the dhyanam process is on, then what happens is the mind learns to slowly reveal that pure awareness. And a stage is reached, which is called a Samadhi state, where the mind becomes the Dhi, the intellect becomes Samam. No more thoughts except the thought Aham Brahma Asmi. That state is called as Samadhi state. It is called as the realization state. That is what is being described in the previous slide as mind learns to stay in absorption. This is the absorption state. So focus on the origin of the ego to know the self. So by, when you come to the inner realm, the ego eye starts losing, it becomes weaker and weaker. Till the ego, till the external world was attractive to us, the ego eye was very strong. It wanted to look at beautiful things. It wanted to hear good music. It wanted to listen to the WhatsApp. It wanted to do so many things. So it was very, very, uh, it was very, very vibrant. But through the knowledge of the scriptures, we, are, we make that strong ego into a weaker ego. And the moment it learns to go inside the mind, it loses the strength. It drops itself. That ego I, which was playing such a big role. I am this, I am that, I am rich. I am, you know, all this is all with, together with the body. The moment we learn to take it inside, to reveal the Atma, in the light of Atma, the ego eye gets completely falsified. It loses itself, it is gone. It is suppressed. Normally looking outside is very easy because we use our sense organs. The sense organs like the eyes, the ears, they perceive the world of objects, it is easy. But looking within, can only be taught. 
by somebody who has gone in, discovered the Atma through the, with the help of the scriptures. There is no other way. How is Ahamkara suppressed? Different ways, three ways have been put here. Ahamkara is suppressed in sleep. That means the ego I is suppressed. When we are all asleep, that is called as the laya state, resolved state, the dormant state, or the potential condition. All these three mean the same. It is also called unmanifest state. The sleep state is called as the unmanifest state of the mind. The pure consciousness is revealing that state. The pure consciousness is the revealer of the waking state. The light in which we see our thoughts is the light of Atma. The light in which we know our emotions of love, compassion, achievements, happiness, all that is revealed to us by the light of Atma. So that ego I in the unmanifest condition is called as the sleep state. The Ahamkara also gets suppressed in the form of music. When we listen to good music, for example, a fantastic uh, melody, which you like, you know, for you, it may be a particular singer, for me, it may be a particular instrument. When we listen to music, we get lost in the music, the ego I gets lost. Similarly, when we go to Switzerland, we go and see a beautiful scenery, a fantastic scenery. It can be anywhere in the world. Our eyes are, you, are attracted to seeing and then the ego eye is lost. In a good movie, for example, we get lost. The ego eye is lost. When we smell roses, when we go to the gardens, uh, gardens uh, by the bay, you know, or we go to a beautiful garden and smell the roses. Again, the ego eye is lost. The five sense organs are attracted by the world of objects. The ego eye is also lost when the body gets dropped and the ego eye is waiting to take another body. Again, this is nothing else but the unmanifest state. As we exist in our sleep state, so we exist after the body drops. That's all. There's no difference in the two states. Only in this, uh, only the difference between the sleep state and the uh, death state is we come back to the same body after uh, in the sleep state. In the death, we just get into another body, another baby body, that's all. Into another environment, another, another life starts. The life starts of the same ego I. Ahamkara is born out of ignorance of Atma as an Adhishthanam, Udayasthanam. That is what Ramana Maharishi is saying in this particular verse. Where is this Ego I, where is it born from? How is it born? See, the Atma gets covered. This is what we, we say in Maya. You know, the, 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 we, the term we use we, is Maya. Maya means what? Two things. I don't understand non-apprehension of Atma, of the reality called as Atma. And then the second thing in uh, uh, that is called as the veiling nature of that power. It's, it's a power in us. It's a power in all of us. Like the Nidra Shakti, the sleep, the, uh, the, uh, the power by which we go to sleep. We have another power, which is called as the Maya power. The, the power of sleep 
covers the weaker. The power of Maya covers Atma. So it's called as the wheeling power. Then it also has the, that Maya also has another power. That power is called as the projecting power. When I don't know I am Atma, I project that I am the body and I am the mind. This is called as the delusion. The effect of ignorance is delusion. And this gives us fear, insecurity, anxiety. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen in future? How this ego eye is always insecure when it is in this body. When it is with the sense organs, when it is in the play with the mind, this ego eye is always insecure because it goes to unmanifest condition. The first thing we should understand is this ego eye has got two conditions. One is the manifest and unmanifest. Many of us are not able to realize Atma because they still are not able to understand in their own intellect that there is a phenomena called as unmanifestation manifestation, which is happening to all our minds. This is still not been registered unless until you register this clearly in the mind, we will never be able to know our real status as the pure awareness. Let it sink into your unconscious mind that there is something called as manifestation of the body, mind and the world and the unmanifestation of the body, mind and world. Both these are happening in Prakriti, in nature. But I am not a part of nature. I am Purushaha. I am. This is I'm using the language of the chapter 13 of the Bhagavad Gita. Where it says, I am not the Prakriti. Prakriti means the non-self, Anatma. I am not the three bodies. I am not the three states. But I am beyond the three states, the three bodies. Beyond the Prakriti, beyond the nature, I am that pure awareness. So the solution to the ego I is called as Advaita Aikyanishta. What does this mean? It means that there is Atma, which is Advaitam, non-dual. Non-dual means what? It alone exists. It is independently existent principle. And what is this ego I? Ego I in its real nature is this pure awareness. That is why it is called as Aikyanishta, oneness with the Atma. Advaita Aikya Nishta means oneness with the non-dual self. Firmly abiding in it is called as Nishta. So by firmly abiding in my real nature, I can get rid or I can falsify the ego I. It is also called as Jivatma Paramatma Aikyanishta. That means this Paramatma means nothing else but this big I. Jivatma means the small Ahankara I. Aikya means oneness. Nishta means firm abidance. So abidance in the oneness of the individual and the total Atma. Ekatva, Purnatva, Advaita Nishta. These are all Sanskrit names, but they all talk about the pure state of awareness, which is one and it is Purnaha. It is always full, always fulfilled because there is nothing else, right? It's all, it's full because it's bliss. It's bliss by nature because it is, there is nothing else it needs 
to to be happy that is why in the all the scriptures it says that the moment you realize this pure atma you will be blissful you will be in peace that is the ultimate peace which we are searching in life ultimate peace absolute peace why we call it absolute because there is no other peace apart from that peace it is eternal peace and it comes by knowledge it comes by inquiry into the atma on our own we will never discover it that is why it is the called as the path of inquiry who am i is a path of inquiry we have to use our intellect sharpen the intellect reduce the quantity of thoughts improve the quality of thoughts change the pattern of thought thinking through with the help of the scriptures on our own we can never do it the i as i explained again and again is we have to use the wisdom which comes from the scriptures from the bhagavad gita the seventh chapter which i'll be taking this saturday para prakriti apara prakriti same topic here ramana maharishi is revealing to us he's throwing us the light by which he, he all of us can get this benefit and realize this truth which is there in the scriptures they are beautiful verses and like i said they can benefit if we learn to walk the path which ramana did thirty first verse it tells us what should i do in meditation very beautiful verse see each of these verses are extremely powerful verses they have deep meaning and they can reveal to us our inner depth diving in the silence by the mind inquiring about one's root alone is the true self inquiry here he teaches us how to do that inquiry this i am this is not my nature this i am this i am not this is the way of inquiry these thoughts are a limb of true inquiry again he is teaching us what are the baby steps of opening our mind opening our intellect and getting the light of atma revealed to us all these verses make a lot of sense if you are used to meditation if you have done some meditation in life you will enjoy these verses because he is teaching us in the seat of meditation how do i see the atma how do i experience that atma how do i realize my true self this i am in the seat of meditation we have to bring this thought aham brahma asmi i am this consciousness this i am not this mind which has got thoughts of the world i am not the moment the mind starts going outside thinking about my cat my you know my house about my car about all this is finished you are already gone outside you are not in the you are not with atma this i am not this i am this i am not this i am we have to practice these thoughts in our meditation practice these thoughts in our inquiry and claim that pure awareness as my real nature so silencing the mind is the way this atma is the witnessing consciousness 
even now you are hearing because of this consciousness i am hearing because of consciousness that is the power by which all our transactions happen i am is that power let this thought of i am that pure awareness come deliberately in meditation this is the path this is the way this is the technique of realization let the thought come aham brahma asmi aham atma asmi i am that pure when we say atma you should remember what is that atma that atma which is revealed by the scriptures which is beyond the three states of consciousness which is beyond the three bodies gross subtle and causal which is beyond the five koshas the five dresses annamaya pranamaya manomaya vigyanamaya anandamaya the basic definition of atma from the tattva bodha i remember i have to remember in order to say i am not this and to say i am that sat chit ananda which is a part of the second part of the atma definition this is what he is trying to say here in this verse the basic definition of atma i am not the three states the five koshas the three bodies that is what ramana maharishi is bringing here as this is not i am not the i am not this i am not this i am this is the second part of the atma definition aham satchit ananda asmi i am the pure ever present ever existent consciousness bliss both the thoughts are important for this inquiry this i am not the body senses mind brings the thought bring out this thought deliberately maunam or silence can be at three levels at the gross level it is verbal silence i don't speak it conserves the verbal it conserves the energy it is the withdrawal of speech maunam in a reflective mind means withdrawal of the thoughts in deep contemplation maunam means we stop the chattering of the mind and learn to absorb the the silence of the atma three levels that is why in taitri upanishad there is a beautiful verse which says yato vacho nivartante aprapya manasa saha anandam brahmano vidwan na bibheti kutashchaneti very beautiful verse it says that this pure consciousness can never be revealed by words or the mind the words return without revealing this is the way taitri upanishad describes and ultimately says words in the last state of discovery the words are also dropped like the pole vaulter he drops the pole and then crosses it so similarly i have to drop aham brahma asmi and then revealed and and know that whatever is revealing this thought aham brahma asmi is me the final atma that's all that one thought so all my preparations are to bring that one thought in my mind whether it is yoga whether it is pranayama whether it is 
uh, Yama, Niyama, whether it is Japa, whether it is uh, going to pilgrimage, all this is only to bring that final thought. It's so difficult, you see. That is why uh, we have so many different karma yoga, you know, bhakti yoga, all that is for that one final thought. And that has a power. It is so powerful. It can reveal that pure consciousness. Very powerful thought. The mind gets tremendous strength out of this thought. Tremendous strength. You will not be able to imagine what type of strength you can get from this powerful thought which comes from the scriptures. Thoughts are used for realization of a fact which is existing. It's a fact. Atma is not something new. It is me, myself. Only thing is, I didn't know that aspect of mine. It was covered for me. We assert to remove the wrong notions and the habits of the mind, which gives me that I am a limited entity. Contemplation leads to egoless state of being. The spiritual being is a state of being, pure being. It is not a state of nothingness. It is not a state of blankness. It is a state of pure being. Atma vichara means inquiry of Atma is the goal and it should be, it should lead to the notion that this ego I is false. Ahamkara mithyatva nishchayaha. In Sanskrit, it means falsification of the ego I. The inquiry into Atma should lead to the knowledge that ego I is appearance, Atma I is existence. With mind dead to the worldly roles, we enter the dialogue with the Guru for Satya Atma Vichara. This is a dialogue between a teacher and a student. Because this way is the way to realize the truth. To see what I am, the immortal I, and to drop what I am not, neti neti, the five koshas which I just described, that I use my, I am not the sense organs, I am not the organs of action, I am not the mind, neti neti, neti means not this, not this. So I can live with the ego or I can live egoless. Living egoless is called as moksha. Living with the ego is called as living with insecurity, living with sorrow, living with an appearance, a vesham, a dress. Whereas living with atma is security. I have found my security not in the external world or a house, I have found a security inside me, which is eternally there. The Guru has taught me this. The, in, the scriptures have revealed this security, the secure, ever secure Atma. I learn to lean on the Atma and not to lean on the external world, which can change so dramatically, so fast in the world. So inquiry without the Shastra, without the Bhagavad Gita and Upanishad is not possible. Inquiry has to be done with the scriptures of the Gita and the Upanishad, which leads to moksha. Like we use a microscope to reveal the small bacteria. We use a telescope to reveal what lies in the moon, what lies in Mars, what lies beyond in the cosmos. They are instruments which we use. 
the instruments are called as pramanam they aid our eye to see things which our normal eye cannot similarly the shastra the bhagavad gita or the upanishads are the aids to reveal the atma they are the only instruments which can reveal atma that we must be very clear if i don't use the gita or upanishads as an instrument i will never know atma this is what the scriptures themselves say okay i will stop here and we will continue with this particular slide or page 131 of the notes because this is a, a mahavakya vichara it will require a little bit of more explanation so i will continue this particular page and the following other pages of this verse next week so these are all step by step processes by which we learn how to realize our own true self very beautiful messages they give us the ultimate truth if you can follow this one text properly verse by verse you understand every verse to the depth of what ramana maharishi he wants to reveal at the same time use the other verses of the bhagavad gita use the verses of the upanishads which you have heard before combine it with that and then you will realize the atma perfectly Om Purnamad Purnamidam Purnahat Purnamudachade Purnasya Purnamadhaya Purnameva Vasishade Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om let me see if there are any questions today okay uma is asking a question do i bring the thought i am the pure witness during my waking state or only during meditation um okay very good question initially bring this thought i am the pure consciousness witness initially in meditation once you have learned to drop the other thoughts and you have learned in meditation to be the witness then it is possible to to realize this even when the eyes are open even when the eyes are open you can say i am the witness but initially we must learn to realize the atma in the state of meditation this is what was revealed in the drik drishya viveka as the two types of meditation external and internal first we learn the internal meditation of how to claim atma because it is a process it is not an haphazard methodology there is a step by step teaching involved you can never do it on your own next week when we do the mahavakya vichara which is the essence of the whole upanishads and the bhagavad gita you will learn that process next week we are going to start that process of how to do this in our own self in the seat of meditation so uma then this is the uh, this is the way it, what what it is we learn to do it in see meditation is also a part of the waking state but only thing is with open eyes or closed eyes 
with closed eyes we start we practice and we learn how to do it once it's like uh, it's like doing any other exercise once you know how to drive then you can you know leave both the handles of your bicycle and then you can drive around the 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 uh, bustle of uh, serangoon road you know or orchard road so once it's it is it is uh, it is how like for example acclimatize acclimatization of the mind acclimatization of climbing mount everest before you climb mount everest go to the peak climb slowly go to 5000 feet take a rest go to 10000 feet take a rest go to 15000 feet take a rest then you will find that you can easily climb so similarly try to go step by step learn the technique first slowly try to the technique is the most important thing that is why listening the scripture shravanam is the most important 80% of the job of realization is over if you do proper listening of the scriptures the 10% is comes from mananam reflection 10% is by nididhyasana 80% is listening correctly and then you apply whatever you have listened you apply but we can try i mean quickly we can say that is why in my meditation sessions i took the opportunity to teach how to practice also quickly so that you observe the thoughts then you know that is the first step a simple step i observe all my thoughts but that is not the ultimate step this is the first step then you say okay i am not the thoughts then you say i am the atma all that is a step by step process okay um the the so big questions today oh my god uh it's been a very inter uh, interactive session okay uh akshay is asking G, uh, jeevatma means the small ego yes you are right they say jeevatma and parmatma is one without a second that is also right that is what is called as the oneness i kyam that means the ego i gets to drop and it learns how to merge with the uh, 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 the big i the atma i how ego can be parmatman ego can be parmatman wait for the next session i will teach you how it can be parmatman because that is what is called as mahavakya vichara you must learn the technique if you don't know the technique you will never accept this so the technique is important that is called as mahavakya vichara which is taught to a person a seeker at the end of upanishads but i will explain to you next week don't worry i think jivatma might be parmatma identified with bmi yes you can think but you you what you what i what i suggest is it is the same atma which appears in the form one ek atma appears as the jivatma and the paramatma when we say jivatma it means the atma identified with one body when we say paramatma it means ident atma identified with the whole universe there is one atma it is in the waking state it is getting uh distributed as a jivatma and paramatma in the sleep state both these become one and they become eka atma i learned to, when i say atma you should be careful you should only take the pure awareness principle when it becomes the jivatma what happens the body the mind the reflected consciousness and that awareness principle is there that is the total jivatma the total paramatma means the whole universe as the body universe with a total mind with the total reflected consciousness plus the original consciousness which is the awareness 
I can never say that Jivatma and Paramatma are one with reference to the body because it's it can never be. I can only say the Jivatma is one with Paramatma when I learn to drop all other upadis, the mediums, and then I learn to negate everything else except the Atma, the pure consciousness. So that in short is the answer to your question. But next week we are going to discuss this particular point which you have raised today. Good question, but very deep answer required. How to defeat, Shama is saying, how to defeat the Ahamkara I with the help of Atma Vichara is the practice of silence to be done as a separate exercise apart from the Dhyana. The second question, what to do when there are doubts even in the field of Atma Vichara? Okay, very good question. See, the doubts can be only <coughs> cleared through the process of Mananam. And in Mananam, again, we have to bring back whatever we have learned in Shravanam. That means I have learned about Atma in Kathopanishad, in Bhagavad Gita. I have to bring that knowledge again in my reflection and try to get the answers and remove the doubts. Doubts can also be removed in a session like this, where you learn a little bit more. You can ask another person, you can ask me, you can ask another friend of yours. Slowly the doubts will get removed. But the removal of doubts will come only when the Atma is clearer and clearer. You see, what happens is, our mind is still got a lot of impurities in them. Our mind. Yeah. In the form of doubts, in the form of confusions, in the form of delusion. Sometimes it is due to the tamasic nature of the, of the mind. It deludes us. This is what is taught in the Bhagavad Gita. Beautiful chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is chapter 14 of the Bhagavad Gita which tells us the three gunas in the mind. That is the chapter which will reveal Atma to us in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 14. It tells us about the three gunas. That means I will learn what is Sattva, Sattva guna, I will learn what is Rajas guna and what is Tamo guna. This is and the knowledge. Can I just ask? Yeah, go ahead. Namaste Shekhuji. In terms of this tamas guna, and I really, this is very relevant at this point. Would you say that sometimes the doubts are related to where the mind state is? For instance, there are days when we are in a very sattvic state of our mind. There are other days when we are not so quite sattvic. And so our ability to listen, to meditate, to everything is similarly affected because the mind is just not in that state because these fluctuations therefore can be very despairing you know it actually creates more doubts like today for example i'm in a very sattvic mood my mind is very clear i heard every word of what you said on at other times i'm not able to listen you know uh, uh, so clearly. So this is what I is the question. Does the mind change from day to day? The mind changes every minute. <laughs> okay. The mind changes every second. Okay. So the change which is there in the mind is a complete flux which happens every second of our existence. In terms of the gunas? In terms of the gunas. Okay. All right, that explains uh, the yes. reason for the doubts. That's right. Yeah. You see, the yeah. mind is a changing phenomena in this universe. Fantastic. You see, we have learned about the atoms, uh, uh, the elements going in circle, and you know, you have you have studied medicine, so you know, uh, you know the uh, energy, how energy is, uh, you know, the we have dissected the element, the matter, the atoms, and so on. But what we have never done is that there is a power 
which is be, which is inside these atoms which is called as the power of uh, these gunas yeah and the gunas are rapidly changing for all of us yeah and the well, mind is nothing but the three gunas in sattva rajas and tamas at uh, I, I, it can happen in you for example uh, after is uh, you doing some japa and all that you may be in sattvic mood for another 10 minutes 20 minutes 15 minutes one hour after listening to an absorbing talk you can again feel that oh my god i was so absorbed i could yes. forget about myself and you know listen to yes. this talk so that is called as the sattvic sattvic nature of the mind but can you see how st stupid the mind can be where today i am in this mood and i'm very clear why i am because simply that i've slept well can you just imagine yes you know so my mind is so yes uh, some simple thing like this and i was thinking why do i do this you know try to stress myself or oh i will have only this much sleep or whatever no so that, is, that is why i would recommend any time you're confused about so many things happening around you take yeah. a good nap <laughs> thank you Take Thank a good you. nap of a 20 minute nap. You can put an alarm after 20 minutes and get up. You don't get Wonderful. nap when your mind is confused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank but, you. but I am giving you a practical example. I'm just telling you that yeah, it makes so much it. sense. Yeah. Today I've discovered that. Yes. And it is that the chapter 14 of the Bhagavad Gita, very important chapter. You can go through the verses yourself. You will learn the uh, the nature of the gunas and how they bind the jiva, that is what is you should learn. The tamas is also binding us by making us lazy, by making us deluded. Yeah. So this is the nature of the tamoguna. It is not the nature of me. I am. I was thinking what's happened to me. Can yeah. you imagine? Yeah. That's correct. You see, you we all get deluded. You know, we yeah. say we feel that there's so much of joy in the world and then we get deluded and then we run after things and then we suddenly find, oh my God, I've totally yeah. got lost and I, I think I have to go back and, uh, you know, take, take, yeah. take stock of the situation. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Okay. Then uh, Rao is asking very beautifully, very nice explained how meditation and science are the tools to contemplate on Atma. Yes, that's beautiful. That's Ramana Maharishi's mm -hmm. style of teaching. Fantastic style. Uh, okay. Then uh, what happens to the Atma after it attains moksha? Does it vanish or is there no life and death cycle? Okay. Uh, this is from Lata and very nice question. These are all very deep questions. Uh, what happens to Atma? Number one, nothing happens to Atma because it is eternal. There is no change. There is no Vikara. There is no modification. Atma simply is. It's a pure consciousness in which the whole world is coming and the whole world is going. That's all. I am there as pure consciousness. I do not have any change with reference to my nature. That is why we call it as nature. My Swarupa. What happens is everything else is changing. The mind wakes up, the mind goes to sleep, the uh, body undergoes changes. I, the Atma, instead of remaining as Atma, I have got lost into the body or the mind and I get confused. So the status of moksha is for the mind, which was identifying with the body and the mind as itself. That mind learns to disidentify with the body and mind and join Paramatma or Ishvara, which is that Sakshi. It is a natural process which happens when you learn the scriptures correctly. Very important is learning clearly what is said in the scriptures. If you listen correctly and you learn, 
you will not miss it so what happens is the mind drops its ahamkara the ego i is dropped as a false i and nothing else then you live then you are just uh, you are living a life where you don't have a wrong notion about yourself that's all and then that is why it is called as jeevan mukti atma doesn't vanish but the uh, 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 atma always remains that means what you realize is i was never born i i the atma was never born but the body was born the body comes into waking state dream state this is a manifestation and manifestation this is the knowledge i get about the anatma the ego i the waker i and the dreamer i the sleeper i but that is not me i am the sakshi which has got no life no death cycle the life and death belongs to the body the gross body and the subtle body it has a life and death but then that is the that is at a lower level like the waker level is a uh, like the dreamer level is a lower level compared to the waker i similarly the super waker i which is the consciousness is a higher level which is the pure consciousness and i say i am that pure consciousness and i learn to drop the waker i the ego i could you elaborate on a bit more on the 30th verse on the part about controlling the breath and the speech mind control speech control pranayama yes see these are only a technique which ramana maharishi is saying what he is saying is initially all of us will not be able to realize this pure state of being which is called as the turiyam or it's called as the atma it is difficult for 99.9% of us so what he says is mind control means uh okay the pranayama pranayama is a technique of the yogas yoga has got a specific technique by which you inhale you exhale that is a separate technique you have to learn but okay if you it's not that it's 100% only if you learn yoga you will come to atma it is not true it is one of the technique for some it it has worked otherwise also you if you don't do yoga also you learn to control the mind by bringing the ex, dropping the sense organs from the sense objects that is the first step once you have done the sense objects and the sense organs are not bothering you in the seat of meditation then you are living with only your thoughts now the thoughts have got many Sorry. many topics it's got office it's got family it's got what i should do in the afternoon today what i should do in the morning i should rush to office all these external thoughts are also there along with this i thought so there are two things inside the moment you enter the mind there are two things there is a one i thought on un, uh, surrounded by all these external thoughts of so many actions now this i have to learn slowly to drop all other objective thoughts and then come to this i thought which is the ego i once i come to the ego i slowly it will happen it's not that you know it, 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 all of us it can we can reach this level there's not a problem now speech control is a natural thing which will happen once you have learned to control the mind that means you will not be speaking uh, you will not be speaking uh, very rapidly you will learn to speak slowly because your mind is in control so when the speech is controlled it is like the organ of action is being controlled when the mind is in control that means the jnana indriyas are getting controlled so you have controlled both the jnana indriyas and the karma indriyas speech refers to the karma indriyas 
organs of action. Breath is the pancha pranas, the five pranas. Breath here stands for the entire five pranas. And then the mind refers to the jnana indriyas. So what he's saying is this body consisting of the five pranas, the five jnana indriyas, the five karma indriyas, you learn to slowly bring it under your control. You are the jiva in this body. I am the pure consciousness. I have forgotten my nature. I have taken the, the, the pranas, the indriyas to be myself. So what here uh, uh, Ramana Maharishi is teaching us is learn to drop these external things come to the ego eye and ask the question, where is this I rising from? This is the climax of Ramana Maharshi. Where is this ego I coming? Every day morning I get up, I just say, I am doing this, I'm doing that. But where does this I come from? And that is where the process of inquiry starts. And then that small I, the ego I, learns to drop itself and says this ego I is only a temporary I in the waking state. In the sleep state, this ego I is, is, is not there. This waker I is not there in sleep state. So then I think, oh, this waker I is only in this one state of consciousness, which is the waking state. The dream state, there is another I which is there, which is another ego I which is totally different. It is identified with another world of thoughts. And the sleeper eye is, uh, uh, is the eye, which is another realm, which is, uh, which is of total ignorance. So I am not all the three. I am that pure awareness, which is always there. It is equally present in all the three states. So I learned to separate that ahamkara ego I and the Sakshi I. Yeah, Shama. Thank you, Shigeri. Okay, good. So, I can see, see. I can see the realization in your face because you're smiling, <laughs> and you can see. So, why is this? The question is, why all these many years have I actually fostered this ahamkara I? You know, I've invited the ego I in my house and been feeding it yes. properly all these many years. Why have I done that? Since how long did you not know Japanese? <laughs> <laughs> no answer. So many years you didn't know Japanese language. Even now you don't know Japanese language. No. But you, the moment you learn the Japanese language, you put an end to ignorance. So the answer you to say now I found that you are my enemy number one. Yes, then, you have found the enemy, which is the ego I, and now yeah. you see. Actually, the real answer to your question is prarabdha. My prarabdha. I thought as much. Yeah. It is your prarabdha. It. It's, 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 it's you know that's you know each one of us at some time in our lifetime we learn about this atma and we get free. That's all. As a kid, I think I knew who I was, but I thought the world knows, so I must ask the world. Yes. And the world has taught me all that I have properly fed my ego eye. So it's so mad. It's so mad. Yes. You see, this is what is the power of Maya, the Shakti of Maya, the delusive power of the mind. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Katie, one last question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, right? Uh, just now, um, you said that it's also part of prarabdha why um, the body or the ego eye goes through the experiences that it does. Yeah. But at the same time, when we discuss realization, from uh, from the atma point of view, none of these things even matter. Yes. But from the body point of view, uh, when a student is trying to study this more and more, the progress he or she makes in the studies, does that also depend on prarabdha? See, prarabdha is only to explain certain <laughs> questions which we cannot answer directly. The law of prarabdha is generally uh, used 
at a lower level not at a higher level so the moment you are slowly progressing towards the level of understanding the atma more and more then what happens is all these other questions and confusions will get dropped off free will is also there which is uh... yeah the free will is there and then you will drop off all this you see these are all only question and answers till the to to silence the mind <laughs> right the mind gets silenced the intellect always wants a logical answer that is why yukti is important in our scriptures they teach us through reasoning the intellect will only get satisfied if the reason is given to the intellect with the reasoning the intellect learns to quieten and then it is ready to receive the knowledge of atma and then it, it that gets illumined automatically so from the point of view of perspective the question itself doesn't yes, make sense yes that's correct the questions Thank get you. dropped off because there is a process of reasoning which is required in the whole study correct yeah regesh you were saying something hello yeah hello. i want to add one point here yeah akshay so actually this free will thing is uh, our prarabdha or our nature is like a river flowing to the ocean okay so by discrimination we can control it like dam you can make and it will flourish you know, farming and all like that yeah so by discrimination we can control a free will yeah you can yes you can that's another way yes you are right that's why viveka is one of the qualifications which we tatvabodha they teach us viveka between atma and anatma vairagyam use the free will to drop the anatma come to atma so you are right akshay you, you, your thinking is correct <clears throat> okay any other questions uh, venkatesh did you ask something no no I, i'm just saying the same thing like dispassion and discrimination all this is free will only where yeah. yes yeah pra, though prarabdha is there prarabdha is what you see in the display but what you have want to act that is your free will that's correct yeah so listening to shruti is your free will correct yeah okay so we have taken a long time today for the question and answer very nice deep questions deep uh, you know reflections we'll continue the talk uh, uh, on this uh, next week again uh, it's a beautiful text Uh, you will get a lot of benefit when you revise these texts because you have heard it but when you go through even the verse meanings if you just go through it you will you will get you will ca- you will catch up with the essence of the whole text thank you good night shubhraj thank you shekhar ji thank you thank you shekhar ji good night good night hari om hari om hari om hari om hari om